Good morning. It is Tuesday. There are two days left in this course. Today and tomorrow. Hopefully that's, I mean, I'm assuming that's like an exciting prospect for most people. Please let me know if you're here in the comments. Okay, what are we up to today? Well, um, this is, my personal opinion, one of the most interesting days, uh, only because I find human evolution fascinating. And today we're going to take uh, a look at human evolution. Uh, I used to do this as sort of like a lesson with a note. Uh, and then the one part that I wish I still had was I did like a, um, like a skull walk where I, I have this at school, where the school has a set of um, skulls. I mean, they're, they're fake, they're reproductions, but they're, they're, they're based on uh, real skulls uh, of a whole bunch of different um, parallel hominids. Uh, Australopithecus, afarensis, uh, Homo habilis, Homo, Homo neanderthalis, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, and then I can lay these out and you can see where they overlap in time. I have like a little timeline that I lay out on the desk. You can see where they overlap in time um, and like which ones were alive at the same time. Uh, it's really cool. I don't know. I don't know why Miss Skinner would have them in her room. <laughs> it's possible. They belong to the science department. Uh, I... We, we lend them out to other departments, uh, anthropology and stuff. So uh, this, this is possible. I don't know. Uh, I used them last quad, so uh, yeah, they're cool. I agree, they are cool. And, and there's also, um, there's also a, one of a chimp, uh, a, a gorilla. So you can compare other, um, uh, other primates as well. Okay, so, so you may have seen a similar set. I, I don't know if, if anthropology has the same set. Um, or it, it's a pretty extensive set. Like, it's, it's a set of, like, ten skulls. So uh, I'm actually surprised that they have that in anthropology. But fair enough. Uh, I, I don't know if they borrow our set or if they have their own set. But anyway, I've, I don't know. But that's, that's cool. So you may have actually seen these before. But um, it, that, that part's missing, unfortunately. I have no way of doing that kind of, like, over the internet, but um, I, I did alter the lesson a little bit. This is actually for block two, but I, I got excited about it, so I'm talking about it first. Um, I used to do this, like, like I said, as a lesson, and then I spent some time last quad um, just looking around to see like what, what kind of cool visuals are out there, what kind of like cool videos exist on YouTube or, I don't know, some other service, see what I can find. Uh, and the, the answer is a lot of really cool stuff that is arguably a lot better than my dry lesson about uh, human evolution. So I, I've kind of switched up a little bit how, how this works from, from how I used to previously do it, because I think this is just a more entertaining way to do the same thing. So um, this is based on a chapter in the textbook, chapter 8.7. So if you're like, I don't want to watch videos, fine. Not It's not a huge deal. You can read chapter 8.7. I would watch the videos anyway, but... Um, Oh, most of the key stuff from these videos is in chapter chapter 8.7 in your textbook. So there there is a way, and my lesson was based off of chapter 8.7 and helped me kind of organize it. Um, so just as a heads up, that's that's available to you as well. It's page 358 to 361 in your textbook. But but what this is 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 a a playlist of videos. Uh, and going along with the playlist to help sort of direct your thinking while you're watching these, like what should you be thinking about? Um, I've sort of established some like basic, these are the things that you should learn about while you're watching these videos. Okay, so th these are the general, I call them learning goals. Okay, so these are the learning goals while you watch them, what you should get out of the videos. So the first thing is, why is there no first human? That, or, or first of any species. That, that question doesn't immediately make sense, and especially because uh, people are primed to discuss humanity like there was like a first guy or a first girl. But that doesn't really make sense when you sort of mesh um, evolution together 
with what we already know about human history. There's there I mean because there's no first of any species ever. There the and you you this probably intrinsically makes sense if you think back to this idea of like small changes over time, which we've been talking about with speciation. It's it's not it's not like a, a it's not like you just a, a baby is born of whatever species and then you're just like oh yeah that's the first lizard or the, like that's the first gecko or whatever it's not not, not exactly like that they're, they're, these are these are small changes that happen over time like when does when does it actually become this species it's like a blurry area not not like a there's no line so anyway I don't I don't I want to I don't want to preempt all the videos here but. Um, that's the first question to sort of think about. And the first video examines that question in a little bit more detail, this idea of first human. What happened to the Neanderthals? Neanderthals parallel branch of hominid, um, very much like us. Where did they go? That's the second question I want you to think about. Um, some techno uh, Name some technological innovations that spurred the rapid change in human evolution. So humans are a little bit unique and then we have something called technology. We have the ability to manipulate our environments, pass on the ideas that uh, on how to manipulate them to a subsequent generation, things that most animal species don't have. Uh, and that being said, chimps and dolphins and things like that actually do teach things to their young. Um, so there are, uh, so that's, that's not entirely accurate, but, but humans do it in a very complex way. Uh, and so uh, specifically, what are some things uh, with technology that have spurred rapid changes in human evolution because that that technological evolution can actually interact with the process of natural selection and so that is occurring and has occurred for humans so what what are some examples of that that's in one of the videos explain the relationship between modern humans and other primates so that would be like wh how are we related to chimps gorillas bonobos um like what what's the relationship there i think that's the second last video and then the last point here is what what does collective learning mean? And what was the importance of collective learning on the development of modern humans? So that's the transition from Neolithic to modern human. Neo, when we're talking about Neolithic man, we're really talking about the same, I mean, it's the same species, it's humans, but Neolithic man is essentially humans with very basic technology, fire. Maybe they had the ability to make arrowheads or like an, a knife out of rock that, that, that's, that's what people would call the stone age that's that's neolithic man so there i mean obviously there's a great deal of difference between neolithic man and modern humans not necessarily genetic so genetic is there's probably minimal difference that's a fairly short time period between Neo, neolithic man and present although there i'm sure there are genetic differences but um but they're relatively small so in that in that in that time span it's collective learning that's doing most of the changing and a lot less genetic. So that's when we're sort of leaving the realm of biology and entering the realm of anthropology. Uh, we're getting into more of the arts here and less of the sciences. Um, but, but still, I mean, you can scientifically analyze this idea, but, but collective learning is a really key concept in how humans have changed over their entire history. So I guess this is like a little bit of a bridge in anthropology here. And, and you know what? You guys may have talked about collective learning in anthropology. I actually have no idea what you learn about in anthropology. So there, there's, there's definitely possibly some intersection between those two here. So anyway, I've broken down these questions into videos. And for each, there are sort of some sub questions that you look at. I would go through and read the sub questions first, uh, just so you know what you're looking for as you're watching the video. And then you can go back and answer them when you're done. So, and, and that's, that's basically block two, which is that you're going to go through this playlist and there are various things that I'd like you to think about as you're watching the, these videos. They are extremely well produced, super well fact checked. Um, so, uh, I, and I, I looked into it. I, lo I, liked, I looked into all of these videos. So they're, they're, they're really well made. So I, I, um, I'm satisfied to uh, hand the reins over to these YouTube videos for this lesson as opposed to just giving you a dry um, you know, note for you to do with me. So, so, um, anyway, here they are down here at the bottom. At the end, I do have a little Lexa quiz, uh, for you to try. This is supposed to be a block two, but I got excited, so I jumped ahead. Anyway, block one, <laughs> reversing gear here. Um, we talked yesterday 
about the idea of speciation. Today, we're going to talk about sort of some patterns in which speciation can occur and different types of evolution can occur. And so one example of that, and I'm just going to give you an example, because so when I say patterns of evolution, people are like, well, I don't, what, what does that mean? What's a pattern of evolution? Well, let's say you got a bird, okay, and this is the classic example. I'm using the classic, classic Darwinian example of this. But let's say you've got a bird. Kind of draw because the features are kind of important for. And that bird gets washed up onto an island. Okay, maybe pregnant bird, or already, or actually no, eggs are fertilized after they're laid in birds. So maybe there's a male and female. Okay, mating pair. Or maybe a few of them are transitioned to a new island on a log or something like that. Uh, this this is this type of um, this pattern of evolution is very common on islands because this is where you see a introduction of a brand new species to a habitat that has never seen this particular organism before. Okay, so this pattern of evolution is really common in that situation. That's not the only situation where this happens. Uh, for fish, for example, it happens when a new breed of fish is introduced to like a pond or a lake. Uh, cichlids are an example of that. I think I think um, this is discussed in, in uh, one of the videos, so I'm not going to go into super detail there. But okay, imagine that this bird has just shown up on this island. Okay, and it's a small population of birds. Well, this bird is going to have variation in their population, just like any population is going to have variation. It's going to be long beaks and short beaks, and long wings and short wings, and long legs and short legs, and everything in between. There's going to be variation. And the more population you have, the more variation there's going to be. Okay, it's a sexually reproducing organism. There's going to be different combinations of these variations. And on the island, there's going to be a variety of niches. Niches are sort of like roles that the bird could take on. Maybe it's going to be an eater of nuts or seeds. Maybe it's going to be a consumer of insects. Maybe it is going to be nesting on the high ground. Maybe it's going to be nesting in trees. You know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, like, and 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 what niche it fills, what role it's going to fill on the island, is going to depend on where it fits, like what its characteristics fit. So, because there's variations within the species, one species may actually fit into different roles on the island depending on their variation. So, for example, you might end up getting some of these birds that have a longer beak. See how good I can do this here. I can do my best. You might get one of these birds that has a longer beak. <laughs> That's a little bit of an extreme. I'm I'm uh, doing this for uh, for emphasis, so <laughs> so it's a little bit easier to see what I'm talking about here. But maybe one has a longer beak, and then this one is particularly good at catching insects or spearing fish. Okay catches fish. Then the the same beak on a different organism, not the same beak, a different beak on the same organism, the ones that have the really, really short beak are really, really good at getting nuts okay, or seeds. You know, they can crunch the nuts up with their short beak. Okay, so we've got two sort of variations in the population that can take on different roles or different niches okay and then maybe we get a version here that has really long legs and that really long-legged one is really good at walking in marshes I'm going kind of on an extreme here, but. And then we then we have another version of this bird that. That has like really little tiny stumpy legs. And these ones are good at like hiding in leaves and stuff like that underneath trees. So 
what we're what we're seeing here is that sort of the variation in the population is fitting into different niches in the natural environment. Some with particular extremes of this um, physiology are going to fit into one niche, and ones with another extreme of this physiology are going to fit into another niche. And what ends up happening is that these become separated. And you guys talked about that in speciation yesterday. Um, they become, over time, really quite different from each other and become reproductively isolated. They no longer well mate with each other. They don't recognize each other because they are either physically separated on the island or something else is keeping them apart. And maybe there's some other mechanism that is reproductively isolating them. You know, maybe this bird is too tall to engage in um, in mating behavior with another bird that has that is too short, you know, over time. So, so what happens is these begin to evolve to, on like separate pathways. These become more and more different from each other. And over time, you develop a, a, a number of related species that are, um, but, but, they, but they are nevertheless different species. They, do, they cannot interbreed with each other any longer because they're too different from one another. Uh, but they are related, they're similar. And so this actually goes way back to our to the very first unit that we talked about. This is sort of the basis for the idea of a genus. A genus is a grouping that includes a number of species that are very closely related together. And so you could think of all these different organisms here as being part of the same genus, uh, but they're not the same species anymore. They've actually become a separate species. So anyway, that this process of a organism moving to a new area and then filling in all these different niches and then sort of adapting and uh, and evolving in different directions is called adaptive radiation. It's called radiation because these different pathways are radiating out from a central species. That's where the word radiation is coming from and their adaptations for the various extremes of the physiology. Okay, so that, that, that's the idea of adaptive radiation. That's one pattern for how evolution can present itself in nature. So when we're talking about patterns of evolution, this is a significant pattern. This one is fairly common. Uh, and there are some fairly recent observations of this happening. They're, like I said, they'll talk about the cichlid example and the Darwin's finches. Um, those are probably the two most famous ones. Uh, so anyway, this video here is going to go through a number of these ideas in terms of patterns of evolution. You're going to read chapter 8.3 in the textbook, um, but only the chapter on, uh, only the section on adaptive radiation on page 341 and 342. The other parts of that chapter are covered extremely well in this video. So it's, it's not word for word, but it's basically exactly the same as what they cover in the video. So you really don't need to read anything past um, the adaptive radiation section because it's, it's not giving you any additional information. Uh, but, but I will say that this video is a little bit loose, fast and loose on adaptive radiation. You're gonna need a little bit more detail, whoops, it is. Uh, and so you should read that, at least that part in the textbook. It, it, it gives a little bit more background into adaptive radiation, which is an important mechanism, uh, an important pattern in evolution. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the main thrust here, um, is that you're going to be looking at adaptive radiation, divergent and convergent evolution, and the idea of co-evolution. We talked a little bit about coevolution yesterday as a pattern. That's when there's like sort of two organisms are evolving against each other or with each other. Um, and so th there's a little bit more detail about that today as well. Okay, so that's the basic premise. Um, add any terms to, to your vocabulary list. Once you do that, um, you probably have 20 words. If you don't, after you do the human evolution thing, you'll definitely have 20. Uh, don't forget to submit your vocabulary list once you have your 20. Uh, you'll definitely get there today. Today's the last day of new content, so like you'll get there. So when you are done your vocab list, don't forget to submit it. And then there are a couple questions from the text and a little exit quiz to go along with the patterns of evolution content. Okay, so that's that's actually for block one. Sorry, I did these in the wrong order. Block two is the little um, the video um, playlist on human evolution. I am going to come back at 11.05. I gotta take attendance anyway. Uh, and I will take questions if anybody has any questions about any of this adaptive radiation content or patterns in evolution uh, before we get into the human evolution stuff. Okay, guys. Um, 
I'm just going to be in the background marking stuff. Uh, let me know if you need anything at all while you're going through. You don't understand the concept, something doesn't quite make sense. Don't forget, don't feel bad about posting in the chat. I'm, uh, But just if, if I don't uh, see your post right away, it's only because I'm watching a student's video here in the background. So I, I check it after each one, but sometimes I'm a couple minutes behind. So just be aware. Okay. All right. Let me know if you need anything, guys. Good luck. Okay. So a couple questions. Um, I'll, well, I, I'll may as well do the question from yesterday first. In a chronological order here. So the first one that you asked was uh, 335 number seven is if species are not changing, is it true to say that natural selection is not happening? Explain your reasoning. Okay, interesting question. So what we're talking about when we're talking about, um, oh, is this gonna work? Hello? Frozen. Frozen? Sorry, just one sec, guys. There we go. Okay. So, um, we kind of covered this in the note yesterday, although it, it probably wasn't immediately clear. Um, so, imagine that you... So, this is, a species is not changing. Okay? So, let's we'll pick the shark. Or an alligator. And you can, you can think about about really any feature of the shark here, but you got your fin and <laughs> it's gonna be a horrible shark. <laughs> this looks more like a dolphin, I think, than a shark, but oh dear. This definitely looks more like a dolphin than a shark, but I'm no shark uh Shark biologist, <laughs> I don't know. shark. Okay, so we, you, you can you can really pick any any co component of its anatomy that is ridiculous. That's definitely not where the eye goes. I don't know, but uh, you 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 can look at any any component of its phys physiology. You can look at the length of its fins, the fin location, um, the patterning on its skin, the number of teeth. You know, you pick pick any trait. If you look at this particular um, physiology for this species, whatever it is, of shark, um, they haven't changed a lot in a long time. Okay, so if you, again, just, just pick a trait. I'm going to graph it over here. Let's say that we looked at number of teeth. That's a genetic trait, it's assigned by the genetics of the shark. And then we have population. Oh, I actually just did this in reverse. I always mess these graphs up. Number, number of teeth goes down here. Population goes here. And again, you could pick any trait, any genetic trait from the shark if you wanted. And if you were to look at a distribution of these, you're, you're gonna get probably something that looks like a normal distribution in, in that the vast, vast majority of sharks are going to have a particular number of teeth that is average for a shark. And it's possible that this is actually really specific. So in other words, 99% of sharks have a particular number of teeth for that species. Okay, and again, I'm generalizing by saying sharks, but let's say this is a specific species, great white sharks, okay? But no matter what, and so if that's true, by the way, that then the curve is going to look like this. It's going to be a lot more peaky because it there's like a really really high proportion that have a particular number that's fine that this is this is just a different type of normal distribution but there is always going to be variability in the population okay so you have to think well what would happen if the shark had more teeth in this given population okay and again i'm picking i'm just picking a random trait here well teeth cost uh and en cost energy to produce so if you have more teeth than you need in order to properly consume your prey, that would be like up here, that's going to be a disadvantage to you. You don't require them. And so if you're producing them, there it's just more energy that you have to devote to teeth, to teeth building. Whereas, and you can look on the, the opposite side, if you don't have enough teeth, 
well, you're going to run into the problem where you don't have enough to properly tear apart your prey or whatever. Um, there, it's ineffective. So there's a sweet spot here. The number of teeth is in its sweet spot. You, you have just enough to do the work that you need to do and not too much that it's overly energetic in order to produce them. Okay, so teeth, in other words, what? and again, pick any trait, but having more of these is a disadvantage and having less of these is a disadvantage. So that, that is a type of selective pressure that's acting on here in both directions. Too many is bad, too few is bad. And so what's keeping it the same over a long period of time is a type of selection, stabilizing selection. And stabilizing selection is a type of natural selection. It's removing the extremes always from the population. And so when you look at a species like they mentioned here in number seven, which is a species that's not changing over time, that is looking very similar from generation to generation to generation. And for sharks, some of them have been the same for 50 million years, a long time. Well, why were they the same for this long? Well, a lot of their traits are experiencing stabilizing selection. The extremes of those traits are not favorable. And so the species is staying the same over a long period of time. That, but, but So then the second part of this question is, is it true to say that natural selection is not happening? No, because natural selection is what's keeping it the same. It's selecting the average because there is very, the, I mean, the only way that that could be true, that natural selection is not happening, is that if there's no variation in the population, that is every single shark is exactly the same. And that's just not true. It, I mean, it might look like that as an external observer, like you look at them and you're like, well, they're all the same. But if you actually evaluate their populations, they're not, they're not identical to each other. Some have longer fins, some have shorter fins. Now there's maybe not a huge amount of diversity in those traits. They're all relatively similar but there is some variation. There's always variation in the population. And even just due to random mutation over 50 million years, however long sharks have been relatively the same, there's definitely been mutations that have occurred that have caused variations in the traits or maybe even new traits. I'm, I'm sure new traits have evolved, have, have shown up in the population over 50 million years. So, so that's, so, you, so, that, so if that's true, if new traits have been showing up and they still haven't changed over an extremely long period of time. Well, there is a type of natural selection at play there. Stabilizing selection is keeping those particular traits the same over time. So anyway, I'm, hopefully I answered number seven here. Stabilizing selection. And the same thing can be true for humans. What's, what's true for humans over the last 50,000, 100,000 years uh, from Neolithic up until modern humans? We, we physiologically are very similar uh, and that's because there is a great deal of stabilizing selection taking place in the human population. Now, I'm not saying that we are genetically identical. We're probably not. Certain traits are favored in the human population over others. Um, but, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll stop talking. But, but in general, there is a lot of stabilizing selection happening for humans as well. That's keeping us relatively the same over time. So the next question was page 345, number four. Many species of fish and waterfowl are darker on their upper surface and lighter colored below. Oh, perfect. I picked the shark here, great example. A lot of sharks have this exact thing. So they have darker coloration on the top. And then if you look on the underside, especially if it's, especially this is especially true for smaller sharks, but they often have a lighter coloring on the, on the bottom. Uh, how do I make a different color blue here? This is actually true for a lot of different um, aquatic animals that are swimming through the water column. So um, this may not be immediately obvious in terms of why it's valuable, but let's first of all investigate the, the pattern of evolution that's taking place here. So what's happening is that a whole bunch of different species unrelated to each other, fish, bivalves, um, mollusks, you know, octopuses, you, all, all, a whole range of aquatic animals are taking on the same type of trait, which is lighter on the bottom, darker on the top. And, and it, it's very common in the animal kingdom in aquatic environments. So we have unrelated species 
that are taking on the same type of adaptation to their environment. They're evolving the same mechanisms for a reason. I mean, the reason is really not that important in order to figure out the pattern of evolution. But anytime that you have different origins, so we're talking about completely unrelated species, but they're, but they're evolving the same characteristics, that is convergent evolution. That's the, the pattern that's at play here. Because we have different um, evolutionary lines of completely unrelated organisms coming together and converging on the same strategy to accomplish a goal. And that, that, that's, that's the example of like butterfly wing and bird wing. So those are both wings. They both do relatively the same thing. They move air around in order to bring flight to the animal. And they're both wings. But the way that they do that is different. They, they, don't, have, they don't have a common evolutionary origin. So they didn't evolve the idea of wings once. And then the butterfly and the bird just like took a different path. That's, di that's divergent evolution. When you have re closely related species that are sort of using the same adaptation in a different way. In other words, like dolphins and humans, dolphins have used their sort of arms, arms uh, as fins. They're, they're using it for movement in water. And then humans are using their arms for a completely different um, purpose. We're using them to you know, grasp objects and things like that. But the, but the fin, and at least in the fin in dolphins and in humans, has the same evolutionary origin. They, in fact, have mostly the same bones in them. Uh, but they're just used for a different purpose. Same thing for like the bat wing and the human arm. If you were to look at them, they actually contain the same bones. They have wrists, um, they have fingers, uh, but, they, but they're just being used for a different purpose. So they've taken the same evolutionary origin and then they've diverged into different uses for the same sort of pattern. That's divergent evolution. But this is an example of convergent. A number of different species, disparate species, are coming together and showing the same trait, basically. In this case, this lighter on the bottom, darker on the top. So then the second part of this, so that's the first part. What pattern of evolution is at work? This is convergent evolution. The second question is, well, what's the purpose of this? And so this, this might not be immediately obvious. And you know, to be perfectly honest, if you spend if you know nothing about aquatic ecosystems, maybe this makes no sense to you. So if you do a brief Google search, you'll be able to find this really quick. But the basic premise behind this is if you're a predator and you want to eat this, this guy's like a little shark. And that's why I said this is more common, by the way, in smaller sharks than it is in large ones, because they're more likely to be prey than a large shark. I mean, a shark's just a fish. So small sharks are basically just they're small fish. So they there are bigger things that eat them. So if you're lighter on the bottom, and imagine that this, this fish is swimming in a water column, right? If you look up, let, let's say that you're like a, you're a, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna use shark here as I'm gonna, because shark could be predator and prey. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use bigger shark and smaller shark, okay? If you look up as an aquatic organism, you know, you're, you're looking around trying to find prey to eat. Well, the lighter underside of this organism here blends in with the light sky above it. It looks fairly similar in color to the sky. But if you are an organism viewing this the other way around, so let's say that this little fish is swimming lower in the water column, now we've got this other guy here swimming higher in the water column. Well, the exact opposite is true, right? The bottom of the ocean is actually really dark down here you're looking down into the dark depths and so then the upper part of you your upper coloration is actually blending in with the darker below the darker landscape below you and so darker on the top provides protection to predators looking at you from above and lighter on the bottom provides protection for predators looking up at you from the bottom and so this, this pattern is really common in aquatic environments because who doesn't want that? <laughs> who doesn't want to blend in with their environment from above and from below? Uh, and so you get the best of both worlds. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the premise behind why this has been a convergent evolutionary trait. Michaela, I'm hoping I answered your question. I think that was your question, right? 345. Yeah. OK. Ho hopefully that, that answered the question. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. 
messages? Yeah. I mean, I'm giving you like the textbook answer. It's a suggest possible. I guess you could think of some other ones. I, I can't personally think of another reason that that coloration would exist, but I'm fairly confident that is the reason. Okay, um, again, I won't take up any more of your time. You guys are moving on to now the human evolution playlist. Uh, again, I'll be here the entire time. If you need anything from me, I can, uh, or if you want to chat uh, about something more in depth, please come and join me during the Google Google Meet. Um, I will mention that you should definitely try the exit quizzes. There's sort of a good um, general overview of the stuff that's been covered, and give you it'll give you a bit of an idea of what I'm going to ask on the quiz. Okay, guys. Yeah, let me know if you need anything. <laughs>